Hello everyone, I'm Abbas and with me here today I have Team 16379, the Kooky Bots from Sammamish, Washington. This team has just been absolutely killing it this season, perhaps most famous for hitting that 1 plus 10 max autonomous first uh, in the power play season and recently they won the Inspire Award at the New Mexico Championship as well as they were the finalist alliance captain qualifying for the Houston World Championship later in April. I'm so excited to jump into all the subsystems on the robot, both the hardware, software, and more, all coming up on First Updates Now. This video on First Updates Now is made possible by viewers like you and also the following sponsors. At Kettering University, over 30% of the student population was in high school robotics. These same students have received a portion of over $7 million in scholarships. Scholarship applications for FIRST students are now available. Get more information at kettering.edu slash FIRST. SOLIDWORKS is free for FIRST teams. Over 80% of U.S. engineering schools and 370,000 plus companies use SOLIDWORKS to design great products. SOLIDWORKS can help you design a great robot on desktop or on the cloud. Go to SolidWorks.com slash first to register your team. All right, guys, let's start with your guys' drivetrain. A lot of teams are just running standard mechanisms. You guys are anything but. Uh, I think you are very famous for having that four motor, four servo swerve that's extremely competitive at the same time as very innovative. So walk us through the hardware real quick, and then we'll talk more about the software and what made it so competitive today. Yeah, so this is actually the second iteration of our swerve drivetrain. Uh, featuring Axon Mini Pluses for module rotation, and then a single bear motor to turn the wheel. The reason we've chosen to run with the Swerve Drivetrain is it allows us to retain holonomic motion capabilities while allowing us to utilize traction wheels. So in essence, we have 20% faster acceleration and uniform speed and traction in all directions um, compared to any other uh, holonomic drivetrain. Um, I'll just run it real quickly so you can see. So this is turning without scraping, and any combination of those. Sure. From the software so, perspective. Oh. Yeah, and you know, before we jump into the software, one thing I have to ask is like, for many first year teams, seeing something like this just zipping around the field, the question is like, why isn't every single team in the world doing this, right? So uh, what is your evaluation, like from a hardware standpoint of the viability of Swerve for both advanced teams as well as just beginning teams? Developing it during the season is definitely tough. So uh, we actually made the first iteration of our Swerve Drive um, in the summer before this season, and we were able to take everything we learned from it and improve everything to get this Swerve ready for competition. Um, it definitely has its advantages, although the mechanical and software complexity can definitely be a challenge as well. Sure, and you know, one more thing before we jump into the software is, I know you guys are using four motors and four servos, so have you guys had like any power draw issues or is that something you've had to consider when deciding the, uh, like deciding the actuation components for all other subsystems in the robot? Yeah, so our robot um, obviously has a lot of servos on it. And one thing that's really nice about running servos is they're extremely high efficiency. And we are able to optimize all of our mechanisms to run at peak power output, meaning we're not wasting um, any of the power coming out of our actuators. So we actually pre-calculate beforehand how much current each of our subsystems are going to be drawing in order to ensure that we stay under that 20 amp, 20 amp cap that's um, imposed by the fuse on the battery. Sure. And Mason, you look like you have a lot to say. So let's talk about that software. Tell me what's behind it and how has it changed throughout the season, if it has. Yeah, so from the software perspective, uh, all the original kinematics for the Swerve, uh, which were done over the summer, uh, were abstracted from an, uh, an FRC level paper. And to track these modules, what we do is we utilize the uh, Axon Mini Pluses, which have an analog encoder capabilities. And these update really fast, so we're able to constantly get accurate uh, heading for each of the modules. Uh, which is really nice. Yeah, and so I know you said they update really fast. I think one thing I've seen you guys talk about a lot, like on the Discord and at competitions, is your guys' loop time, and it's something you guys have been focusing on really optimizing. So why is that something important for teams to optimize, and how have you guys done so? Yeah, so with Swerve, one of the things that requires is really high, high loop times, and, and the reasoning for this is that we always need to keep a very accurate tracking of our heading, uh, so to solve this, what we did is we moved all the encoder ports to uh, the control hub. That way we only have to bulk read one hub. We also thread the IMU. And the reasoning for this is because uh, when, we call, when we make an IMU call, uh, it halts the entire program for roughly four or so milliseconds. 
And by threading it, uh, we then don't halt the program, which is uh, really convenient for all the rest of the robot to keep running, especially sure. accurately too. Yeah, no, that that's great. And you know, at the end of the day, the Swerve is still a drivetrain in the sense that it has it has to localize itself somehow, right? Like your robot needs to know where it is in autonomous uh, and teleop for some teams. So how do you guys do that? And uh, has it had any changes throughout the season or has it just really been working well from the get-go? Let's start with the hardware on that. Yeah, so from day one, we've been running a two dead wheel plus IMU setup. Um, we have two sprung modules and these are the modules that we open sourced, uh, Baby Auto. It's just extremely compact and it's been reliable since the get-go. Yeah, along with this, uh, so uh, we also do seven PIDF controllers on the drivetrain. Four of those are actually dedicated to the uh, modules. The other three are used on the robot's position. Uh, so we take in the, obviously, the uh, two positions from the odometry uh, modules, as well as this, we also take the IMU. Um, and the reasoning we use a PIDF over a, like, Pure Pursuit or Roadrunner is we actually found it to be a lot more reliable for us. We originally used a custom uh, Pure Pursuit implementation, but because a lot of our movements are very linear, uh, and we need that high acceleration, and Swerve gives us that high acceleration, uh, we found a generic PIDF to actually be a lot more efficient for us. So. Sure. And so, you know, in chasing that 1 plus 10 and finally achieving it, you guys have to optimize literally every single subsystem on your robot, the drivetrain definitely being one of them. So how has the Swerve impacted your journey to the 1 plus 10? And are there, like, other considerations you took into play with the drivetrain that really helped you get all 11 cones scored on that high junction in 30 seconds? I think drivetrain speed's been pretty nice. It takes us uh, 1.2 seconds from our starting position to get to the position where we need to be cycling from. And part of this has been just raw speed. And part of this has also been that we've optimized our robot's starting position so that we have to move the absolute least um, in autonomous. Um, and we are able to do this by um, having our camera on the side of our robot actually. So we only have to turn about 10 degrees and just slide across the speed, at, uh, across the field at full speed. Sure. And so, you know, before we move on to the rest of the subsystems under robot, going into the world championship, I know you guys aren't just going to settle for what you have now. You definitely want to do better, perform better. So can we expect any big changes from the swerve? I know you guys don't want to leak too much, but just a little bit. Give us something. Yeah, without leaking too much, uh, we have a version three of the swerve drivetrain coming uh, where we're going to be replacing a bunch of the previously 3D printed parts with machined aluminum, which should not only be um, lighter and stronger, but just hold up a lot better across competitions. All right, guys, let's uh, jump into your guys' intake. I think with your intake, the number one adjective that comes into mind is just speed, pure speed. Every single part of it is just lightning fast. So let's start with your claw. Walk us through it briefly and how you've gotten it to be so light and compact. Yep, so the design considerations um, when making this intake subsystem were um, exceptionally lightweight, uh, rigid, and also compact. So starting with our claw, uh, we have a, um, like your standard uh, geared claw where you have two sides, both actuated by a single servo. What makes it special is that we only have a single carbon fiber plate. One claw is dead axled off of that plate, and the other claw has a heat set insert attached directly to the servo. And this allows it to be extremely lightweight and compact. Um, compared to other designs that we've seen so far. Going on to your intake subsystem, I know you guys just have degrees of freedom galore. So can you give a brief overview of the degrees of freedom and then we'll talk about how you control everything. Yeah, so obviously starting off, we have our slides, which is what makes our robot what it is. Uh, then we have our arm, um, which is a virtual four bar. However, the bottom pulley is also actuated, giving us another degree of freedom in this pivot right here. Uh, which allows us to grab a lot faster off of that um, autonomous stack. Uh, finally, we have our turret, uh, which is what allows us to transfer cones into our deposit. And then we have that claw that we talked about earlier. Sure. And so with controlling so many degrees of freedoms, Mason, how do you guys do it in a very efficient and quick manner? Yeah, so there's a few things we do. So for starters, what we do is we, or we organize a lot of our subsystems in their own classes. So for example, there's a drivetrain class, there's a lift class, and an intake class. And what a lot of these things do is they hold all like, the different hardware objects we need. So like a servo, motors, all that. And we do this just so it's a lot more organized and whatnot. Um, to control things in parallel and really accurate, we use the command-based uh, styling, uh, styling of code. And with like we have built-in delays and whatnot. So for example, uh, actually, let me just initialize real quick. So for example, when I'm down here and I want to grab a cone, 
I can uh, I can issue I can issue a new command. And what this will do direct it up like that. We have a lot of presets in our code too, which is really nice. Uh, and using command base, we're able to you know uh, run things on se sequentially in, uh, in parallel as well, which is really nice. Yeah, no, that that's fantastic. And so looking back, like at this robot uh, and going into the world championship, what is like one thing you guys would change about your intake subsystem, if anything? Mainly focusing on rigidity and reliability. One of the issues we've had is with such a complex robot, if even one thing slips up, uh, then you're <laughs> you're not in a great spot. So uh, main things we'll be focusing on for the world championship is just the overall rigidity and reliability of our subsystems. Got it. So going on to your deposit, I mean, you guys have one of the fastest deposits I've seen this season, and it's also very light. So let's first start with a hardware overview of it. You know, talk about how exactly you're holding the cone uh, and how that's changed throughout the season, and then we'll get into the software behind it as well. Yeah, so to hold the cone in, uh, it's a combination of three main things that have been iterated heavily across the season. The first is this front bracket, uh, which has a shape uh, that not only guides the cone in, it also uh, supports it from the outside of the lip. The second thing, we call it the Pringle or the potato chip, just because it looks like one. Uh, it supports the cone from the inside. It also helps with guiding. And another cool thing is even if we misgrab the cone slightly, this will um, push it back into the claw as it's being transferred. Uh, finally, we have a submicro servo mounted to the side over here. It might be a little bit hard to see. That's what this wiring is for. Um, and what that allows us to do is once our cone is fully seated, uh, the latch can just go down. And now when the lift accelerates up, once it reaches the maximum height, the cone won't pop out and it'll make depositing a lot more consistent. Sure. And so are these like iterations you talked about, like the special shape of the of the front and then like the potato chip or Pringle and the micro latch and all of these things, were they were they iterations or were they all features you had from the very like day one design of the robot? Yeah, so the day one design of the robot didn't actually have a latch and it also didn't have this uh, chip that I just talked about. It was just a plain old bracket here, it didn't have the curve shape and it was extremely prone to mistransfers and failed deposits. And after that, we added the latch servo. Um, and then we iterated on the front piece a bunch more and realized it still wasn't good enough. Uh, so this um, this like potato chip Pringle guide uh, was added to remedy all those issues. And since then, our transfer reliability has gone from maybe like two and three cones, which is pretty bad, to maybe 99 and 100. So uh, one other question I have for you guys before we jump into the software of your lift is, you guys definitely do iterate, right? It's not just like things just work out the first time just like that for Kooky Bots. There definitely are iterations. You guys go through yeah. the engineering design process, but it seems like you guys don't spend a lot of time trying like 50 different things. You notice the problem and then you have the first, like you have one solution to it. So what do you think is like the key thing that helps you have something where you solve the problem the first time you see it instead of developing like three, four different prototypes to a solution? Yeah, so we've tried to embody a very data-driven approach uh, where we try to analyze the exact root of the problem. Most of the time, this is done uh, by taking slow motion uh, videos at 240 frames per second. So we can scrub through in four millisecond intervals and see what's actually going wrong. And we can come up with a way to solve that um, that directly addresses the problem. And this allows us to um, iterate a lot faster and also get down to the uh, root of the problem so for example, going back to the example of the deposit, uh, the reason we were able to come up with this shape was we noticed that when retracting our intake subsystem, just inertia from the whole mechanism moving so fast was causing the cone to rock slightly front and back as it retracted. So even if it was grabbed properly, it would sometimes hit at an angle over here instead of just sliding in. And so we added like a curved ramp shape part um, to address that issue. Sure. And so like, you know, you guys definitely do a lot of like problem identification. Do you guys have some sort of like documentation organization system that you would recommend to other teams? Or is it just like all kept up there inside your brain? Uh, we have a uh, we have a team like Trello uh, where we add like all the hardware and software changes that we're planning on making. And then we just go through those one by one. Cool, cool. And so going on to your lift, and this will definitely tie in a little bit with your intake extension automations. So are you guys just using like a normal run to position command for, you know, going to the different uh, junction heights? Or do you have something else going on there? 
Yeah, so there's a, there's a different, there's a few things we do. So we don't actually use render position. Uh, we use it just a PID along with motion profiling. We actually motion profile uh, both the intake slides and the vertical slides. Um, and this is good for us just because it's a lot more reliable and quick. Um, so if I just quickly extend this up real quick, see like that, I want to grab that. So you can see the slides in action left right there. Um, so one of the things we do is, uh, as your previously mentioned, yeah, we close this latch when we're trying to extend up. And then when we're coming down, uh, we'll close this latch uh, roughly like 10 milliseconds after to give it time for the uh, cone to come down on top of the pole, um, which has been really nice. Uh, yeah, no, yeah. that's fantastic. And I think one thing that's definitely something to be wary of with a design like yours where you have a separate intake and extension is double possession, right? And that's definitely a challenge you guys had going into the OnePlus 10 and, you know, also your OnePlus 5 and all your other autonomous programs. And so how have you dealt with that? And are there any future plans you have for that? Yeah, so there's a few ways we've dealt with this, actually. So, for example, what we do is... Uh, oh, the robot's running right now. Thanks. Uh, so, for example, what we do is we're always checking the encoder positions uh, of both the lift and the intake. So when we're grabbing off the cone stack, uh, we know if the lift is fully extended or not based on the encoder position. Uh, so through this, uh, we know that if it has a cone up there, uh, then it's in control of a cone. So we won't grab another cone until it's dropped a set amount. Um, another thing we do also to, to, uh, using the encoders is we also use jam detection. So this is really nice. Um, just wanna, yeah, something like that. Uh, so what happens in, in auto, if we ever happen to have a goof, uh, where just things happen to go wrong and a cone gets stuck somewhere in a robot and this can possibly break things, we'll detect this and then we'll automatically go and park, guaranteeing the 20 points uh, regardless of the conditions. Um, one unique thing about this is that we also uh, move our parking position as far, as close as we can to the substation. Uh, so we have a really optimized park so we can instantly start cycling as soon as teleop starts. Sure, that's that's fantastic. And CookieBots, I'm sure there's just so, so much more to go on in your hardware and software and electrical and everything. But I think what's something that's really important to end our interview with is, like, what is the one single most important piece of advice you would have to teams that are looking to achieve a level of consistency and high-level gameplay that you guys have been able to do so far? Yeah, so I think this is also one thing that we struggle with, uh, which is, uh, chasing really cool and like the fastest possible designs is obviously fun and it's a cool design challenge uh, but consistency and how you perform on the field across those five or six um, qualification matches and then the elimination matches matters a lot more than just what's the highest score you can put out there also pro tip when you're invading another state don't leave your robot at home <laughs> yes i'm sure that's very helpful so Mason, Veer, thank you so much for this interview. I'm sure the FTC community will really learn a lot from your guys' incredible machine, both hardware, software, and just overall design of the robot. So we're really looking forward to what you guys bring to the World Championship. Any any hints or teasers for us, or are we just going to have to wait? We're game. Okay. All right. Well, again, thank you very much. Reporting for First Updates Now, I'm Abbas, and this is Team 16379, the Kooky Bots. This video on First Updates Now is made possible by viewers like you and also the following sponsors. SolidWorks is free for first teams. Over 80% of US engineering schools and 370,000 plus companies use SolidWorks to design great products. SolidWorks can help you design a great robot on desktop or on the cloud. Go to solidworks.com first to register your team. At Kettering University, over 30% of the student population was in high school robotics. These same students have received a portion of over $7 million in scholarships. Scholarship applications for first students are now available. Get more information at kettering.edu slash first. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and ring the bell to stay up to date on our new videos. Keep the conversation going and provide your input to our content. Watch our live shows at twitch.tv forward slash first updates now. Join our Discord at discord.gg forward slash first updates now. And check out Fun FTC on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And First Updates Now on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter.